welcome to my YouTube channel, Fantasy World. Today I'm going to be reading the book called Winter House, written by Ben Gooderson. Today I'm going to be reading chapter 6, which is called Three or Four Pieces of Candy. One way to transform the word into four into room is four, poor, poor, door, doom, and room. And that is it. That is how you transform the word four into room. So... Let's start reading this chapter. Norbridge led Elizabeth down a long hallway lined with paintings of snowy mountains, sun-sparkling lakes, and what appeared to be various scenes of a winter house both inside and out. She was nearly jogging to keep up with him. I think you're going to love it here, Norbridge said, without looking back. Everyone's getting... Ready for the big Christmas Eve party next week. Presents, fruitcakes, candy, our beautiful tree. We're even going to have dancing after the big feast. We'll have a string quartet with five violins, violin, violins, and would it still be a quartet if there are five violins? Elizabeth said, I thought a quartet meant four. Norbridge stopped. He looked to the ceiling for a moment. It will still be a quartet, plus more people playing with them, I believe, he said. And then, as though he'd intended to stop precisely at this spot, he pointed to a glass case set at eye level in an alcove to his left. Within the case, Fastened crisply and lit with a small lamp was what appeared to be a pair of old and tattered green wool pants. Can you guess what this is? Norbridge said, very serious now. He had clamped his hand over a credit card size play card on the wall to hide it. He stood expectantly. Stiffly. Elizabeth peered into the case, moved her eyes around every corner of the little display. A pair of pants? She said uncertainly. Yes, but whose? I'm sorry, but I don't have any idea. Estern Shackleton, Narbridge boomed, the great Antarctic explorer. My aunt. Ravenna, Ravenna Falls, one of the most beautiful women of her time, er, befriended Mr. Shackleton, and he gave her these pants as a memento. memento. He nodded proudly and lifted his hand from the small placard, placard which read, Esther and Shackleton's pants. He's the one who rescued all his men in the frozen sea, right? Elizabeth said. You're a scholar as well as a puzzle expert and a sea seasoned traveler. That's apparent, Norbridge said. We have a lecture on Esther and Shackleton later this week. You should sure to come. We'll have lectures this week on the status at Easter Island. The therapeutic the therapeutic properties of Indian tea and a personal reflection on the ascent of Mount Everest. We also have somatic Movies in the theater and nightly musical concerts in Grace Hall. Come to all of them. That's a lot going on, Elizabeth said. At her aunt and uncle's house in Dreher, she read or did her homework alone in her room every night while the television blared in the living room. Norbridge took off walking again, charging away, and Elizabeth followed well, we want to keep it lively around here, he said. We have interesting things to see on every floor. 
You can cope. You can poke around on the fifth floor. We have a shirt worn by Harry Houdini, the greatest magician of all time, when he jumped out of a zeppelin and landed on the Empire State Building. He did that. Elizabeth made a mental note to look this up because she'd never heard anything about it. That's what he told my father, Norbert said. And then on the ninth floor, we have a chess set used by Lewis and Clark. Or just one of them. I can't recall. When they discovered America. I believe they were the ones on the Oregon Trail. Elizabeth said because she didn't want to correct Norbridge outright. They discovered so much, he said, his voice full of amazement, as he led Elizabeth up a flight of stairs onto another long corridor. About what about the 14th floor? What do you imagine we have there? Elizabeth wondered how he could think she would have any idea. I can't even guess," she said. Norbridge stopped and gave a shrug. "Nothing," he said. "There's no fourteenth floor, only thirteen. So there can't be anything on that floor, can there?" Before she could answer, he pointed to the ornately paneled cherry wood door beside which they'd stop. But look at this. He said, "On the wall next to the door was affixed a small silver plaque, on which, written the following words: 'The room reserved at all times for Edwin and Orphemy Thatcher. Please do not enter.'" At this point, Elizabeth was thoroughly baffled. She read the plaque again, but she had no idea who these people were. Or why Norbridge was showing this to her. All she could think of was Becky Thatcher from the Adventures of Tom Sawyer. I'm sorry, Norbridge, she said, but I don't know who the those people are. They're billionaires, Norbridge said quietly. Maybe even trillionaires. They come here to Winter House once a year at most. And the rest of the time, they paid to keep this room reserved. Elizabeth, who received no allowance, whose aunt and uncle barely had enough money to keep their house warm in winter, and who had to beg her aunt to purchase one or two fifty-cent books at the semi-annual book sale at the Drury Library. Couldn't imagine spending money to permanently reserve a room in a hotel. Why do they pay so much when they hardly ever come here? She said. Norbert shrugged. Because they can, I suppose. What does it matter when you already have more money than you could ever spend? If something cost a million dollars and you had a trillion dollars. Would it make any difference if you went from a trillion dollars to a trillion minus a million? I guess that makes sense," Elizabeth said, still thinking it through. "I live with my aunt and uncle, and they don't have anything really." Elizabeth explained how her aunt and uncle had spent her sent her for the long Christmas holiday. Even asking Norbridge if he had any idea who had paid for her, but he knew nothing more than Jackson did. Have you always lived with them? Norbridge asked. My parents were killed when I was four. Elizabeth said, "It was a story she knew only from being told by Aunt Purdy." At a Fourth of July show, the fireworks went off the wrong way, right where 
we were sitting. I was too young to remember it. She spoke the words as plainly as she could and tried to keep from letting any sadness flood her. It was quite the case, though that she had no memory of things. It was just in her recollection. There hadn't been fireworks or a crowd or anything of the sort. Something had happened, something terrible. And she carried with her the awful remembrance of a jarring noise and fire and screams. But it was only because Aunt Purdy had insisted all of this had occurred during a fireworks show that Elizabeth had resigned herself to that story. There were, there were times she wondered if her parents had died some other way altogether. One day she told herself when she was no longer with her aunt and uncle, she would try to find out what had really happened to them. Norbridge closed his eyes. I'm sorry, he said. It's very painful to lose our loved ones. Very painful. He pointed ahead. We should keep going. Those two men in the lobby, said as they walked, they've really been working on that puzzle for two years. It seemed to her they had made less progress than she would have supposed, even though the puzzle was enormous. Mr. Wellington and Rajput come to Winter House with their wives three or four times a year, Norbridge said. They stay for a week or two, and a couple of years ago, I dug out that old puzzle of my grandfather's and then dumped it on the lobby table and stared, stared, started in. I think they argue more than anything, but they are pleasant enough, and they like to spend afternoons and evenings puzzling away. At the end of each evening, they put a little sign up that says, Please do not touch our puzzle. And as far as I know, hardly anyone does. I'm happy to let them occupy themselves there. Norbridge stopped in front of two huge wooden doors that stood beneath a sign that said Candy Kitchen. But here we are, he said, although the kitchen is closed now. He held one arm out the gesture to a glass-topped table just beside the doors. It was dotted it was dotted with tall, unlit lavender candles and a huge china serving platter. Huge china serving platters. Stacked with what looked to Elizabeth like sugared squares of candy. Some flourishkin for you after your long bus ride, he said proudly. Please enjoy, Miss Elizabeth. Somers. Elizabeth eyed the plates piled high with candy. She she had candy in wrappers or in boxes or bags, but never any sort of sugary square. Sitting out on a plate. What is it? she said. Blurskin. Winterhouse's world famous confection. Norbridge said, as if informing her of something as basic as the name of the president or what to say when you knock on someone's door on Halloween. Please have a piece or two, or maybe three. He gestured to the table once again, and Elizabeth stepped forward and eyed the candy dubiously. It didn't look that tasty. I've never had it before, she said. Walnuts, apricots, powdered sugar, and a bit more, Norbridge said. Go ahead. A smile came over his face as he watched her hesitate. Ah, I understand. Perhaps you want something... More than candy. No worries. We will have a sandwich sent to your room. 
In the meantime, please have some dessert first. What is it? What is it called again? She said. Blurshkin, Norbridge said. It's a made-up name. Doesn't mean anything, but Nestor Falls felt it had that alpine sound to it. It really, it's really a sort of candy from Turkey. Like Turkish delight, Elizabeth said. The candy Ednam eats in the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? Norbridge leaned forward. Exactly, he said. And after a pause, but this is better, he nodded to the plates. Please go ahead. The plates had stacks of candy on them, each about the size of the kind of chocolates you find in boxes where you don't really know what's inside of each one until you take a bite. Elizabeth took a piece of candy, placed it into her mouth, and immediately in the way a song melts into your thoughts, even if you haven't heard it in years, you realized she had tasted it before. The sensation was so powerful, she felt overwhelmed, she began to chew quickly, studying the candy with her tongue. She couldn't think of when she might have eaten this candy before, but the taste was as familiar as the feel of her blanket as at night, or the smell of red in autumn and The strange thing, though, was that Aunt Purdy and Uncle Burlap never bought candy or had any in the house. Aunt Purdy often informed Elizabeth that candy rotted not only a girl's teeth but also their brain. Though Elizabeth suspected her aunt and uncle just didn't want to spend money on anything as extravagant as candy, she couldn't imagine she'd ever eaten fleurskin at the house in Dran. I've had this before, Elizabeth said, even as she considered if on her list of favorite candies, Flushkin should go above or below Rocky Road Bars, something she had twice. She took one more piece of Flushkin and then another. She kept trying to remember where she'd had it. Can you make it here? Mr. Falls himself perfected the recipe, Norbert said, after he'd, ru he'd been running Winterhouse successfully for a dozen or so years. He branched out into the candy-making business, and, well, Flushkin was born. It's famous all over the world. It's delicious, Elizabeth said. Make that de delicatable, delicatable, delicatable. <laughs> she stood chewing away as Norbridge reached into his breast pocket, pulled out the lunch house coin, and began running it across the back of his finger in a quick little flip and skip. You're a magician, aren't you? Elizabeth said, you know how to do tricks. Elizabeth said, Norbridge said nothing. Without warning, he flicked the coin toward the ceiling. And before Elizabeth realized what was happening, a purple kerchief with silver trim mm -hmm. was drifting downward from the coin. But it seemed the coin had been a split second before. How did you do that? She asked in astonishment. I know magic. Norwich answered as the kerchief settled over his waiting palm. As you said, but that was a coin. You believe in magic, don't you? He leaned forward slightly. Real magic? Elizabeth was flustered 
by the question. The trick Norbridge had done was so startling she wasn't sure she trusted her eyes. Well, yes, she said. I believe in magic tricks. Norbridge blinked. A strange silence filled the hallway, and he looked away from Elizabeth and glanced down the long corridor as if listening for something. His face had a far away look to it, and it seemed to Elizabeth a touch of worry. She looked behind Norbridge, a player card on the wall there said library, and had an arrow pointed in the direction he was looking. Is everything all right? Elizabeth asked. A smile rose on Norbridge's lips and whatever had been troubling him disappeared. Yeah. All fine, he mm -hmm. said warmly. Absolutely. The library is down that way. It is, Norbert said. And because I can tell you like books and will want to visit, you'll find our librarian yeah. eager to welcome you in the morning. Leona Springer yeah. is her name. The library opens at nine o'clock sharp, and he glanced in the direction of the library, and the worried look seeped into his eyes again. He seemed to have lost his train of thought. Yes, it... He appeared flustered and shook his head. Yes, sorry, it opens in the morning. At nine o'clock, you said? Norbridge nodded. Yes, yes, of course. And then he put a hand to his chin before spreading his arms wide and smiling. The main thing I wanted to say was that while you're here, I hope you'll consider Winter House your home. He glanced away and then took a step forward. A step toward Elizabeth. But right now, we need to get you to your room, young lady. I'll send someone with a sandwich for you. Elizabeth took one more piece of foreskin and popped it into her mouth. Mr. Falls, someone called. A bellhop, a young man with flushed mm -hmm. cheeks and a worried expression had rounded the corner behind, him, behind them and was looking to Norbridge. Samson, Norbridge said. The young man and eyed Elizabeth as if to indicate wanted to choose his words carefully in the presence of a guest. Please come right away, sir. Norbridge turned to Elizabeth, slipped a ring of silver keys from his pocket and handed one to her. And into your room... For the night, Elizabeth Somers. He said, Good night, she said, and thank you for the candy. She looked to the bellhop and then back to Norbridge. I hope everything is all right. All is fine, Norbridge said. He strode away and disappeared around the corner with the other man. Elizabeth thought she heard the bellhop say the word library, but she sh be sure. She examined the key in her hand and then headed down the corridor. Well, that was it for chapter six. I hope you guys liked it. If you did, please hit the like button, maybe the subscribe button as well. And if you guys want to see more videos like this, then don't forget the notification bell down below. And that is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed. Peace. Thanks for watching.